Greetings, programs, and welcome back to Thumb Wars, the video game discussion show where we begin the debate and you continue it. I'm your host, Sean Crudefeld, and I'm joined this week by frequent friend of the show and Dark Lord of all Sith. Oh, yeah. Oda, or Lauren Horning, I suppose. You've got to use some kind of name. Nah, nah, you're Oda. You'll always be Oda to me. Mm. Thank you. Oh. Anyway. Yeah, that was a little creepy. Mm -hmm, a little. So, we're, we're here to talk a bit about Gamescom 2015 that uh, basically happened over, what, last week, I guess you'd say. You know, it, it's one of those European conferences, I believe. Um, and, and, and basically a lot of trailers. Not a lot in terms of actual outright announcements. Announcements, like not much in the way that we didn't already know existed. But a lot of new footage of things that had previously been announced, or new expansions, or stuff like that. We're not going to try and cover everything here, because, I mean, there was so much that came out. Oda and I could spend, you know, five or six hours easily just talking about all the trailers that came out of Gamescom. So we're going to try and keep this a bit more, a bit more focused, and we're going to start by talking about something near and dear to Oda's heart, World of Warcraft. Oh, kind of close. You, aren't you like the most famous Warcraft cosplayer, you know, ever? <laughs> I, I, I like to think infamous, actually, but... but oh, oh, yes. Perhaps, sir. yes. As the Three Amigos proved, that's an important distinction. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, indeed. Uh, but uh, yes, World of Warcraft did have a big announcement this year, and it actually surprised a lot of us um, in the community, in the Blizzard community as a whole, because they decided they were going to announce a World of Warcraft expansion uh, at uh, Gamescom, which... Uh, a, they've never done. They've always announced their expansions um, at BlizzCon. And there is a BlizzCon this year. It's it's at the beginning of November. Mm. Um, so initial theories were, of course, that that means that they the beta will likely start like pretty much the day after BlizzCon wraps. Because right. How World of Warcraft is doing its thing right now is that expansions are becoming shorter but more frequent. Yeah, I, I think this kind of is also goes along with the elephant in the room, and that's the fact that news came out over GamesCon that World of Warcraft has seen another significant drop in subscribers. Uh, and this is true. Uh, World of Warcraft is down to 5.4 million subscribers, um, give or take a you know, few thousand, of course. Um, and, and while that's a ton for almost any other MMO... Just a year ago, they were at what, ten million? Uh, yeah, they were. I think they just crested ten million uh, in the week or so after the release of Warlords of Draenor, um, which was the current expansion. Uh, which you know, I, I I will say this: I know very much for a fact that the player base of World of Warcraft is always in flux, as any game, especially MMOs. Um. Still, 5 million players dropped is a lot. Right. Uh, and even for a while, that is a lot. Um, but it's, I, I, it's, it's still 5 million. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's still the big It's still the big dog on the block. It's still the biggest, you know, MMO around. But it does, it does point to, I think, in my opinion, I think what we're seeing is, I like, Warcraft is entering either a new epoch or... Or, or it's it's entered into like its final death spiral. Although I mean, I, look, I'm not saying it, World of Warcraft's going anywhere anytime soon. I mean, for the love of God, you know, the old Republic is still chugging along, and it doesn't have nearly that, you know, five million, and it went free to play. So I mean, but what I do think is that we seem to be entering a new pattern now, where the where, and this is why I think we're seeing more expansions. It's not exactly rocket science. People come back for the new expansion, and then once they've seen what they've wanted to see. They go, which kind of makes sense because the game's been around for so long and people do have other things they want to do. And there's only so much you can do the same thing again and again and again. So, I mean, 
Although, you know, that hasn't stopped you guys from doing that for, what, 10 years now? <laughs> uh, it, we're actually running on uh, 11 years uh, for right. World of Warcraft. And the thing is, you could have started playing World of Warcraft when you were at home, living with your parents, uh, yeah. no job, no responsibility. And if you are still playing today, you are, in statistical likelihood, uh, married or have a kid. Uh, a family, a home, an apartment of your own. Like, your life that, has changed. Would now be a good time to mention that I'm currently have been unemployed for a couple years and have been living at home with my parents and am unmarried and do not have children. But you don't so play thanks, World of Warcraft. Oda. Thanks, Oda. Thanks for making me feel just wonderful. Tomorrow's my birthday, too, so thanks. Thank oh, okay, okay. Happy... Um... <clears throat> no. No. There's nothing happy about it. There's nothing happy. Mm. Happy, Sorry, let's... happy one day closer to death. You monster. <laughs> anyway, let's get back. But let's get back on top. I mean, I think it's pretty clear to everybody at this point that Warcraft is being driven by now by the expansions. And I mean, of course, in some ways, this, this is a band aid. I mean, so, no doubt, a lot will come back. Will as many come back as they did for for the last one? We'll talk about because I do want to ask you, you know, a little bit what you know and what's going to be different. But I mean, I. Before we get to that, yeah, I think we're going to start seeing more frequent expansions. I mean, I wouldn't be shocked, Oda, if they announce a, the next expansion after this one at BlizzCon. You know what I mean? I would be I, real surprised. Cause... I, I, I think they want to make it very clear to the people who are leaving, no, come back, you need to stick around, there's more coming, there's always more coming. So, I, I don't know. I mean, what, what do you... Do you, I mean, in the past, a couple years ago when we had this conversation, you know, about is Warcraft entering, you know, is this the beginning of the end? The, you know, it's going to be a long end, but still, you were very much, nah, 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 nah. You didn't, I, I remember. Do you have a different feeling now? No, actually. Um, a lot of people forget. Uh, now, the numbers are a smidge different now, but mm -hmm. last, we'll call it, uh, a year and a half ago, I think, was when we talked about this last, um, when they announced Warlords of Draenor. Um, the Blizzard was, or, not Blizzard, World of Warcraft was down to about 6 million, 6.5 million subscribers. Then Warlords of Draenor came out, and they were above 10 million. And now they're back down to 5.4 million. Now, obviously, the finite numbers are finicky and et cetera, et cetera, and, of course, Blizzard can pad or not pad depending right. upon the shareholder meeting etc etc but this is just the natural life flow of the game now are more and more people going you know what i'm tired of the dance yeah oh yeah yeah that's why i think it's uh, like a million less players and as we go on on and on and on we're going to see that that number dip down and down and down and down um and while certainly uh, I can't say that the or one of the main characters of this expansion, um, you know, isn't or is not a blatant attempt to get everyone back who used to play back in the day, because they couldn't have possibly known when they started producing this expansion. Uh, it certainly does seem like it. <laughs> Writing's been on the wall for a while. I mean, at the very least, I think within sight, within the next couple of years, I wonder if Warcraft's going to re World of Warcraft's going to reach the point where it has to start deciding. I mean, it's already been edging its way to free to play there's all there are now methods of playing the game without technically playing pain you know if you're determined enough and if you play enough if you're hardcore enough uh yeah yeah or you have a, a in, rich in-game uh friend, right because you can buy monthly subscription time with in-game gold so you don't have to actually pay money um i i mean i i i feel like the end is at least inside or at least we're, we're over the hill now, I think, at this point. It's all downhill from here. You know, I, I might actually agree with the over-the-hill comment. Like, if... And I don't mean that I don't mean that Warcraft's done or anything. I just, yeah, like I said, I think it's all downhill from here. Yeah, I, 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 I really don't think... I mean, even in my, my brain of brains, uh, my theory crafting of, you know, lore and everything, I cannot conceive in my head of an expansion to World of Warcraft that would bring back 12 point some million players, like the highest level they ever were. I, I cannot possibly conceive of that. Um, like, or, or, or that can 
really keep the majority who do come back around in the long term. Yeah, um, and I guess this gets more into the specifics they talked about at the actual uh, conference. But All right, yeah, let's, let's talk a little. What is what's what's the hook for Legion? Okay, um, I guess I'll I'll come back to the this point in a sec. But the um the thrust of uh, World of Warcraft's Legion, which funny, uh, they actually applied for that copyright to that name, uh, days before announcing Warlords of Draenor as mm-hmm. a method to psych people out uh, for Warlords of Draenor because there was a leak uh, for all of the Warlords of Draenor content. Uh, so they filed for copyright of the name Legion, and everyone was like, oh, no, it's not Warlords of Draenor. It's actually Legion. Uh, but, but haha, it, it was Warlords of Draenor, as the leak said. Um, and now they're using the name Legion. But anyway, um, the big thrust is for those who have not or are not currently playing uh, World of Warcraft. Uh, there was a bit of a time travel parallel dimensional story thing, which they're now getting rid of um, by transitioning back to the you know normal timeline. But in this alternate timeline, there is another Gul'dan big evil sorcerer who sells his soul and attempts to sell the souls of his entire orcish race to the Burning Legion, the big demon bad guys. Um, yeah. The bad guys who, if you're not familiar, have been lurking. They're 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 the overarching big threat that have been lurking in the background of War Warcraft since really the beginning. Yeah, since Warcraft one, really. Uh, ul- they're they're like the, they're the ultimate foe that everybody's got to be aware of. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the ultimate dimensional time spanning entity of badness. Um, anyway, so in the concluding uh, spoiler alert for anyone who actually cares, um, plug your ears for the next thirty seconds. Uh, in the climactic moments of this current expansion, uh, the heroes, whether they be the Alliance of the Horde, uh, defeats Archimonde, who is reborn in this alternate timeline. Um, and as Archimonde dies, uh, he turns to Gul'dan, who is hiding in the shadows, and he basically says, we had a deal, you know, you can't escape it. And he basically banishes him through a portal, um, and we don't get to kill him. And he's been, Gul'dan has been the main antagonist the whole time. So we're like, what? Uh, we don't get to kill him? And so he gets sent through this portal, and we don't know what's happened to him. Uh, Archimonde dies again, um, and peace is restored to uh, Draenor. Um, and everyone is safe, and everyone gets along all happy, you know, hold hands, etc., uh, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Not really, but carrying on. Apparently, what occurred, and this is the story of Legion, is that Archimonde's plan was to... Uh, use Gul'dan to enslave this, this Draenor uh, and get these orcs and repeat the events of Warcraft 3 and Warcraft uh, 1 and 2. Basically send the orcs as an army to our Azeroth to try and beat it. To, because apparently we've okay. really pissed off the Legion. Uh, and this deal he spoke, he basically threw Gul'dan through a portal and sent him to Azeroth. Um, apparently. <clears throat> you can't see my giant arm shrug here. But apparently, he sent him to Azeroth. Uh, Archimond, or not Archimond, uh, Gul'dan goes to various points um, in, in Azeroth and sows seeds of demonic corruption um, and opens up this giant portal uh, to basically the Twisting Nether, where the Burning Legion is, and demons flood in, and in an effort to prevent it from happening... Of course, as you would expect, all the big mighty heroes, you know, Taranda and Thrall and, um, you know, basically if there's a name that isn't... On both sides, on both sides. Yeah, on both sides. Like, uh, everybody from, um, basically if there's a main player, if they're a city leader that isn't Sylvanas, um, they basically head to uh, the Eye of Sargeras. Uh, Long story, won't cover that lore. Um, They have a big fight with the demons... And humanity loses. What? Whoa. Yeah. Whoa. Um, whoever is not killed outright uh, is either broken mentally or maimed physically, such to the extent where they can no longer fight. Um, so either you're dead or you can't fight anymore, or they are dead or can't fight anymore. Uh, and the players have to pick up the pieces, uh, rally the world beat back the demonic corruption and find a way to seal the portal hopefully forever and beat the legion so it sounds like 
as opposed to the last two expansions, which were as much gameplay-driven, I think, as they were lore-driven. Certainly there was lore. You got to see the pandas, and you got to go to the alternate Azeroth, and all, I mean, alternate Draenor and all that. But they, those, those, those expansions also had, like, huge gameplay changes as well. Mm. They introduced new concepts, new game. you know. This feels lore like it's a story-driven one. Uh, this does seem to be largely story-driven, and it feels like uh, almost a reset button. Um, this may, and I can't speak to for certain, because the BlizzCon charity dinner hasn't happened yet. I haven't had a chance to email and speak to some of my friends at Blizz. But this seems, uh, and I kind of actually wish, you know, I had a article to write about this, but it seems <laughs> as if, um, and publish it somewhere, uh, it seems as if they are trying to use this to remove from canon and lore uh, individuals. Like, on the stage, when they talked about this... It's tr trying, they're basically trying to pull what like, Marvel and DC will do every couple years. They're trying to simplify continuity and make it more approachable for newcomers. I, I actually think that may be, in fact, what, like a soft reboot, uh, almost. Um, be right. Because... It is very highly hinted that Thrall, uh, which, you know, is effectively Chris Metzen um, in game, uh, praise be upon him, <clears throat> and <laughs> that Thrall being sort of the main guy, and he, I mean, he was the main character in Warcraft 2, essentially, or Warcraft he was 3. Almost, he almost starred in his own adventure game title. Yeah, it, yeah. Yeah, that. Um, he is... And, and it's... And it's his father who's going to be one of the main characters in the upcoming movie. Uh, yes, yes, uh, Drek'thar and and, um, and uh, yeah. Jorotan. Yeah, um, it is heavily, heavily, heavily implied that Thrall is going to die. Yeah, sure. Uh, no, I, I get it, I yeah. get it. It makes sense. But by doing it in a big battle like this, you can kill, you can't see the finger quotes, but trust me, they're there. They can kill all a bunch of heroes, take them off the stage for a while, and then in a couple of years, when they need something big to spike attention, they can bring them back. Yeah, or, but, you know... I mean, hell, they've already introduced alternate dimensions, so killing at this point, I mean, yeah. But I get what you're saying, yeah. Yeah, um, because the one of the big things, there are game mechanical changes. They're putting in a new PvP system, uh, and the big thing, which is sort of driving the whole expansion, are artifact weapons. Um, right. And basically, if a weapon exists in World of Warcraft and it's famous, it's going to now be in the hands of players as this evolving force which gives them authority in the game world. But that, again, that's, I mean, you know, like last time wasn't the big thing like bases with like their whole kind of, with their own like kind of free to play cell phone kind of, oh, you have to check back, you know, the, the uh, Farmville style, you have to check back every, I mean, they were really big. This feels more like, yeah, this is. I think, yeah, so it sounds like this is really just, this is them acknowledging things are changing and maybe kind of trying to just deny reality? I don't know. Is that accurate, you think? I mean, do, or or is this them acknowledging, well, we've got to start reaching out because we're losing the base and we need to bring back people. We either need to get people who've never played or bring back long-lapsed players, so let's bring back a story element that people know, who even who haven't played WoW, I mean, or, or what? Or am I just off base, you think? Um, let's see. To a point, I, I, I can see how it kind of looks like that, because they're going back to the well that was the Burning Crusade, which was right. arguably the most well-thought-of uh, expansion. A lot of people who used to but, play World of Warcraft think highly of it. And also the major threat from the end of Warcraft 3, which, was, which, was, which is still the thing that a lot of people have also played, maybe who haven't even... Like, if you, if you played Warcraft, like, if you want... I, I played these games as much for the lore and the story, and that's why I never really got as into World of Warcraft, because early on, I, I'm talking about in the early days. These days, the story's more in-depth, but back when it was first getting out there, it wasn't as story-driven, and it didn't... Anyways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I, I totally get it. Um, and, of course, uh, Illidan, Illidan Stormrange, coming back from the dead right. uh, uh in this... And I, I also know that, like, I know people haven't been happy necessarily with the direction. Like, I, I've heard a lot of just on-the-edge complaints about the storyline direction for the Alliance, that people aren't happy with the guy, with the with the Gary Stu, who's become the leader. I can't remember his name. You know who I mean. Uh, yes. <laughs> uh... I mean, I, I, I read the friggin' Warcraft comics. I've read, I know his story, I know his origin. He's a friggin' Gary Stu. They get, I mean... They, 
God bless him, but he's a Gary Stan. Yeah, he's, he's King Varian. Uh, his son is the much more interesting character. Um, yeah, that's, that's what I've gathered. And so, yeah. It, okay, so let's just wrap this up and then move on to other stuff. Are you excited for Legion? Or is that a stupid question? Um, <laughs> you know, I think this is the first expansion of which I'm going to be cautiously optimistic. Ah, interesting. Because the whole we're going to kill many prominent lore characters and basically give you their weapons to me yeah. that goes well what does that mean for the future of the story like basically you're what you're where i was when the new 52 happened yeah and it's sort of like well, what does this mean for the story like okay um there, yeah. there's even a hint on on the website because they have a website for the game and you can go and read it and read on some of the characters and they talk about the main cast and on it is Sylvanas. And, of course, Sylvanas is my baby. She's, she's my bae. And, you know, we hang and everything. And I, I know it's Aqua because she's undead and stuff, but it's cool. Um, anyway, they strongly hint. I'm extremely creeped out right now. I, I, I know, as, as, as you should be, as was intended. Um, but they strongly hint that she's going to have to make a life or death decision that may end in her death. In her final death, or rather eternal damnation, um, long story for those who aren't familiar with the lore, but they strongly hinted that. And there's lots of other characters of which um, they write, you know, hey, they're going to have to make some pretty tough decisions. But there's other characters of which they don't touch at all, and you can pretty much go, oh, they're the ones that are going to die. You know, yeah. if they're not talking about these characters being the main focus. So what does that mean for the story? Where do we go from here? And if I can't see where they go from here... What's the game's future? So I'm cautiously optimistic. One last question. Do you think any of what's going on right now has any connection to the upcoming movie? I mean, do you think they're maybe trying to position things? Because you got to imagine they're going to want to... It's kind of like what, again, whenever Marvel is one of their big movies come out, they put out a lot of Avengers stories. Mm -hmm. Or mm -hmm. they'll put out... You know, they've, they've made sure they have plenty of Ant-Man trades out there. Because, you know, corporate synergy and all that crap. So, I mean, is it possible this is we're kind of seeing maybe trying to set things up for the movie or um, if they were trying to set things up for the movie, you would figure that uh, warlords of Draenor would be that expansion that they would put out with the movie because the, the movie is going to focus on both the humans and the orcs, but the orcs will, they'll be equally as prominent as the humans in terms of the story. Well, I, I guess what, what I meant real quick was, is they're basically bringing things to a pretty dark moment. And I could picture a scenario, and time travel is a thing, as we've already established in WoW. Couldn't you maybe see it that things get so bad, finally there's no choice. There's no choice but for the players to go back in time and go right back to where the... I mean, you know, couldn't you see them doing that? Uh, well, they already have us go back in time a lot. I know, I know. You know? I know but this time it's for reals. <laughs> um... <laughs> no, I... I think I've just scared Oda a little. No, see, in terms of an expansion, uh, to me, I think that might be my, my, my stopper. Like, <laughs> if, if they do go, all right, guys, uh, Azeroth is pooched, and you guys couldn't stop the demons, even though that's the storyline of the expansion you're currently playing, or this being in the future. Uh, so... The entire whole of Azeroth that's left goes to the Caverns of Time and hops through a portal. And look, you're back in well, Northshire. You know, you know everything you've been doing for the last 11 plus years, even more if you count the strategy games? Yeah, that never happened anymore. Sorry! Retcon! And DC fans will laugh at you and go, welcome to our world. All right, yeah. So, no, let's not do that. All right, so that's World of Warcraft and Oda's thoughts on that. But there's some other stuff to talk about. A lot came out of Gamescom, but I, I can't... We cannot let any discussion of this year's Gamescom go by without talking about the... The debacle. The, let's see what a word for it. The debacle that is Final Fantasy XV at the moment. I, I don't know how up you are on all this, Oda, or, or how much you might, you know, the rest of you guys out there are, but... Just as a quick recap, basically, as you know, Final Fantasy XV has been in development for a very long time. So long that it originally wasn't Final Fantasy XV, it was a whole other game in, in, entirely. And indeed, Final Fantasy XV has been in development longer than the, than the development cycles of Final Fantasy I through VI combined. And admittedly, those games came out in a very different era when you could have like five or six people. But still, Final Fantasy XV has been cooking for a long time. 
it didn't have anything new at E3 this year because Square went, we're saving it for Gamescom. That's right. We're not going to reveal our big new thing at the biggest video game event of the year. We're going to save it for the much smaller one that most people don't even remember. To be fair, there is something to be said for the idea of holding your cards until at the most advantageous time, and that maybe, you know, it could get lost in the shuffle. On the other hand, theoretically, it's Final Fantasy XV, so who are you kidding? But okay, Gamescom, this was going to be it. This was going to be the moment. This was the big reveal. And what we got... What we got was... What we got was nonsense. I, I, I'm i honestly struggling. I mean, what we got was one of the worst video game trailers, or just trailers, period, I've ever seen. I, what is it you called it before we started recording, Oda? Uh, which? The... The 15 trailer. Oh, the, 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 the Hug Me trailer. Yeah, this is a three-minute trailer, okay? A three-minute trailer. This is the pick that you've been saving and building up for. A three-minute trailer where I swear to God... At least a minute and a half of that three-minute trailer has to be the father of the main character hugging the main character when he's five. I just, that's it. No, he's standing there. We pull back. He's holding him. And we see him just looking out to the dawn. And he's just hugging him and hugging him and hugging him. And the kid even pushes against the father, like, like, stop hugging me. And the father just keeps hugging. And then eventually we pull all the way back and we see... Something in the clouds. Maybe they're meant to be Cthulian monsters. Maybe they're meant to be giant summons. Maybe they're just the, the creator of the trailer farted at the wrong fucking moment and produced... Ah, oh, God. As you can imagine, a trailer... You know, I mean, the first half of the trailer is like a dog walking. We see a little girl getting threatened and, and it potentially looks like getting attacked. And good job, guys. Good choice. In a game where you're already getting heavily criticized for the lack of playable female characters and the role that the female characters that are in the game are going to be playing, opening your trailer, since the whole controversy really exploded, with a young girl getting attacked and implied maybe even raped, that's the way to go, Square! No, no, really! This is supposed to be the Dawn trailer. This is supposed to be giving us the backstory, but there is no backstory. There's no talking. There's barely any dialogue. This is just, I. this is one of the most inexplicable trailers for anything I've ever seen. And especially, I mean, if they'd released this trailer without any hyper buildup, I would have been like, what the fuck was that? But in light of this was what they couldn't show at E3, this is what they kept people waiting months now for. This is the big reveal, unlike... You idiots have no idea what you're doing. And if you know me, you know what a Final Fantasy booster I am. You know that I'm often a Square Enix defender. I liked Final Fantasy 13. I liked all three of the 13 games, goddammit. But this, I... <sighs> Alright, while I try and calm down, Oda, what did you think of this trailer? Um... There is something to be said for cinematography in game trailers. Yes. Now, uh, in looking over the trailer, because I, I actually, because I thought there had to be more. I, I, I you, when yeah. you watch the Techn trailer, <laughs> technically, before we go any further, technically they then did one of their, they did the equivalent, their equivalent to a Nintendo Direct, where they got together a bunch of people, uh, and they spent an hour answering questions, and they showed like a minute of new footage, of actual gameplay footage, of the characters wandering through a swampy area and then dying from a Mara blow. Or however you say its name. Yeah. I, 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 and then they end it by drinking fucking beers on camera. Yeah, like they were celebrating or something. Um, it's like, you guys did it. Yeah, yeah. You spent an hour answering pointless, meaningless questions that didn't really answer anything at all. You told us that you were going to do airships as DLC if you have to, which is great. Yes, that's the solution to all the problems. You showed us a minute of new footage that ended like, oh, just as things are about to get good, everybody dies. Rocks fall, party dies. And then you drink beers, and it's like, you idiot. I... <laughs> Sorry, fin you talk, then I'll then I'll rant mm -hmm. a little more. Yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> the um, the cinematography in the trailer is is actually quite quite good. It, it's there's you know a, a minimal of cuts. There's you know great lighting, flashes, etc. Now, I think if we cut away the hugging. 
Uh, or at least down. I'm saying if we cut away that hugging, and even if we replaced it with more shots of, like, the dudes in armor walking down the street, and it's, like, medieval armor, but they're carrying guns, you know, that sort of thing, it would be more of, like, a mood trailer, kind of sets the setting to show you it's an oppressive uh, setting, you know, that sort of thing. That would have been great, but there is a giant shift in tone at the one-minute mark where the hugging starts. Now... Never let it be said that I am ignorant to the, to the plight of parents and their children. Right. Now, I seeing them hug like that in, you know, for the first, you know, like 10, 12 seconds, you're like, okay, you know, he's either about to hand his kid over to his mother and he's about to go off on an adventure right. or... I mean, yeah, for all we know, I strongly suspect this will probably be like the... I'm expecting this is the end of some sort of playable prologue in the game. You know what I mean? Like the tutorial prologue, kind of like they did in FF12 and all, you know. And and, and, and any context of that prologue, if, if it does exist, it might be a very effective moment. But by itself in the trailer, it's like, what? Yeah, and exactly. I, I think that, sh that shot, which, by the way, is uh, one minute and 13 uh, seconds of the close-up of the hug. Uh, in a three minute 14 second trailer <laughs> yeah that has credits um i'm sure to square who knows the story who knows how the game's going to begin mid and end i'm sure that moment is very important to them which is why they wanted to show it and that's kind of what japanese game developers do they put those moments in the trailers that maybe you might not understand uh it is a different culture um i would be interested to hear how the japanese market is reacting to this trailer uh, My understanding is talking and looking around and reading. They didn't react any better. Okay. Um, it's different cultures. Anyway. Now, with as it went on, as it like approached the 30-second mark, I'm like, okay, all right, I get, no, I get this, I get it. It's going to slowly pan back any second now, very slowly, back farther and farther, and it's going to be like an army is like charging at this guy in his car. Or there's some existential threat that is coming to kill him, and he, this is a father's last moment with his son, you know, and the son doesn't realize that it's his last moment, which is why he's trying to get away. I get it. And then you wait, and you wait, and you wait, and then you get a couple of figures in the clouds, which could just be I, clouds. FYI, in-game, this is not the last moment with the son. Yeah, because that's the main character. They, Right, that's the main character, and the game opens in the modern day of the game, in the present day time of the game. The game opens with the father and the fiance of the kid, who's now an adult, getting killed. Yeah, so, yeah. I'm, I'm not saying that was what it was going to be. No, I know, but I'm just I'm giving people. I mean, yeah. So, I mean, it makes even less sense in con. I mean, I just, I guess what gets me is Square Enix does have some idea how to market. I mean, they also released, like, a pretty damn good Rise of the Tomb Raider trailer, and they released other trailers recently, and they, 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 they've shown that they at least have some basic competence when it comes to, like, like the Last Kingdom Hearts 3 trailer. They, they showed just enough to wet the whistle, but not too much to blow it, especially since the game's not coming anytime soon, and we know there's more coming, but they revealed the world, they let us get a real look at the game, I mean, but this... If this was just a random trailer they'd released, I'd go, okay, well, you know, like, we did get a, di to be fair, we got a big demo, which gave us, like, three hours or two hours of gameplay, you know, and gave us a whole region to explore. They even updated, they even patched the damn demo. So, you know, I mean, technically, they've released a lot of, if you just want to get a basic feel for the game, but then why all the build-up to this? Why save it? Why act? I, I, I mean, and they're playing games with the release date. Like they keep releasing contradictory statements. I mean, and and like several six months ago, they said the game was sixty percent done. A couple days ago, they said the game was sixty five percent done. So in six months, and then a day after that, when everybody was like, "What? Six months? Five percent?" They said, "No, no, it's really seventy five percent done. We misspoke." And I'm like, I don't know what's going on. And it's really worrying, because up until now, I wasn't really worried about FF15. I thought the demo they released was pretty good. I mean, you know, it had some issues, but they were issues you would expect to see in a demo for a game that's only 60% done, you know? Like, frame rate issues, well, that's stuff you that's stuff you tie down at the end, you know? Yeah. 
and, and, and they said, this isn't the final, this, you know, the actual game will have more complex gameplay. And they even released a demo, which which made the gameplay a little more com- I mean, it was like, okay, the demo did its job. And if you didn't want to do any more trailers because you released this honking huge demo, I'd be okay with that. But to build up to this and have it be this? What the hell? You know, if, 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 I, if I had to think on what happened, because to me, this looks like something happened and they scrambled to fix it. Mm-hmm. You know, to me, this looks like they had, like, the in the beginning when the, the girl was, like, getting thrown out. Yeah. Like, that looked like the beginning of a, a trailer. And then the guys in the streets and the guns and the armor. And the, it's like, okay, yeah, I'm totally into this. I'm, you know, I, I'd prefer some other imagery, but okay, let's go with this. Yes. And then it cuts to them, like half a trailer of of this guy in the street hugging um and yeah i can understand like that parental moment yes but it seemed like there should have been other footage there um you know that like showed some monsters or showed some some action because some... If, if it was go- it was something to be big to to promote this thing for so well, long or, or if this had been like from time to time, Square does release like nine, ten minute trailers. You know, yeah. if this if this had been like the middle of a nine minute trailer, I would have been okay. That was a little inexplicable, but I would have just shrugged my shoulders and kept what you know what I mean. I yeah, it's something weird going on. That's all I can say. And I'm still hopeful Final Fantasy 15 is going to be good, but now it real. I mean, up until now, I was quite certain the game was going to come out in 2016. Now, God only knows. Yeah, I'd uh, I, I'd I'd be curious as to uh, to see the stock prices in Square. Uh, yeah. <laughs> after uh, after Gamescom. Well, what's even better is apparently they're going to take this trailer. They said they're going to take this trailer, this specific trailer. Okay, they're going to take it to game shows over the next you know any remaining game shows for the rest of the year. They're going to have this trailer, this specific trailer, so that everybody can see it. Yeah. Hi, right, Square. There's this thing called the internet and i know you know what it is because you released this trailer online okay everybody can already see your stupid fucking trailer I, I, oh oh but each each trailer but they're also then going to have a new ask event where they'll show another they actually put it this way they'll show another minute of footage yeah you guys are fucking morons i i i just they're they're out of touch perhaps um yeah, no wonder they're so desperate to get Western Studios because those studios... I mean, clearly clearly the people behind Rise of the Tomb Raider have nothing to do with this. Yeah, I mean, there, there are different studios and divisions, um, yeah. you know, uh, in like in any other game company. But, I mean, we don't want to dwell too long on this, even though no, this, no, this no. was a pretty huge deal considering if this was not a hype trailer, if this was just right. something they brought... Um, to Gamescom, uh, you know, but they showed something at E3 or whatever. Yeah, it would have been all right, but the hype and the hype collapsed in on itself, and yeah. and that that was their damn damnation was was the hype. If they hadn't hyped this thing, I don't think any everybody would be like, wow, that was a really awkward trailer. Like, wow, but oh, okay, well, we got some gameplay anyway. Oh well, all right. Let's talk so quickly about some other things. Um... First of all, we got to see uh, the reveal for Mafia 3 got announced. I'm very intrigued by this one. All we got really was a cinematic trailer, but then we also got one of the developers talking afterwards, and he basically... So this is going to be set, like, I think in 1968, it's going to be set in New Orleans. It's going to star a mixed-race protagonist, which is cool to see because we don't get enough you know and he comes he's a, he's a you know he's a veteran coming back from vietnam only to find that the italian mob is taken over new orleans is messed with his family and he's like screw this and so he joins the black mob that's the way they describe it and he basically rises up in the ranks with that and he's gonna have like these three lieutenants like if you've seen the trailer the three characters at the end are his lieutenants and a big part of the game is going to be like you'll gain territories and you'll be able to give these territories to be run by one of your three lieutenants and depending on who you have run it, you'll get unique rewards. But also you have to be careful because you have to balance each of the three's loyalty. And if you give them too much, the other two will get jealous or the other one or the one who gets too much might become, you know, greedy. You're going to have to really balance that all out. Then there's also going to be, you know, in an open world environment set in 68, 
New Orleans. It's it's very interesting. They've said, I mean, they're not necessarily setting out to make any huge statements on race, but race will be part of the game. He is a mixed race. You know, I mean, he's mixed race, but he looks black is basically the way to describe it, okay? And so he's treated as an African-American, 1968 New Orleans. And, 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 and you know, the whole race, the whole, you know, you know the... the, the, the all of the stuff that was that was going around in race will be part of this game. It'll be part of the backdrop. Cops will react in certain ways and all that stuff. And so I'm glad to see they're not going to try and pretend it wasn't something that existed. And I think that gives the game potential. And if you've never played the first two Mafia games, they were interesting. They weren't just the upteenth Grand Theft Auto clone. You know, they actually tried to be a little more to that. Like Mafia 2 technically had open world setting, but was really a very linear story driven game. And what's well, I'm very I'm especially interested because this is going to be yeah it's mafia but this one the mafia you're not playing as the mafia you're playing against them, and it's really the the, the creator said something was interesting this is when this is the point when the romanticism of the mob really started to fall away and the reality of just how you know violent and dangerous this all was became apparent and it's it's a potentially interesting setup any th- I, I I'm curious about this one any thoughts Oda real quick uh you know I am always interested when they do put more depth like social issues but as an undertone into games and if they are really going to embrace that sort of 60s racism uh as an undertone thing uh and of course i'm always a huge uh mobster fan like classic mobster stuff and and then there's the setting of new orleans which Mm -hmm. oh i always love when you can do new orleans oh yeah it's 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 a a rich history it's it's very vibrant culture it's great and one that's kind of been underused in games. A few games have used it. Like, I remember the original, the classic Gabriel Knight original adventure game. But considering how rich a setting is, it's kind of been underused. Yeah, it has. I mean, and, and when it is used, it, it's stereotypical usage, you know? Yeah. Um, so it's 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 not something that's ever done well. I, oh, and one other thing they talked about is a big part of this game is going to be music. Because, you know, it's New Orleans in 1968. So, the, you know, the music of the town and of the, the growing, you know, that's going to play a big part, too. And mm-hmm. that would be uh, There's a lot of, I think this one's got potential. The first two Mafia games were better than they had to be. And if, this, I mean, now the bit, I'm not even sure if anybody from those two games is working on this one. It's been a long time. But treating it as its own thing, I mean... Go watch the cinematic trailer. That thing's sharp. I mean, there's no gameplay, but in terms of setting a mood and a tone, that thing is amazing. You know, yeah. it it really if they can if they can really get a game that captures that feel, this could be something special. Yeah. Um. Okay, we got a new trailer for Mirror's Edge Catalyst. Uh, my takeaway was a this looks gorgeous. B I will never play it because. Okay, I, I went over many years back when the original Mirror's Edge came out, came out, went over to a friend's house and tried to play it. I couldn't even get past the tutorial. I'm, I'm not great at first-person shooters, and my worst thing in the first-person mode is platforming. For some reason, platforming in first-person does not go well with me, and I'm pretty good at platforming otherwise. Third-person, side-scroller, whatever, I'm great at it, pretty great at it there, but first-person, I just can't seem to do it. So when the entire game is a first-person platformer, yeah. And, and it's not just platforming, it's parkour platforming when you can't yeah. constantly see your feet. Yeah. it's con- and, and my other concern is, I thought the original Mirror's Edge was a very interesting game. I don't know if it entirely pulled off what it wanted to do, but it certainly wasn't a bad game. But it was a flop financially. Yeah, it's been a cult success. It's certainly a cult success. Yeah, at best it was a cult success. And I didn't see anything in this trailer... That made me, th- and it makes sense. It's a cult success because the truth is, like a lot of people, yeah, a lot of people aren't going to necessarily be great at first-person platforming. That's not as necessarily intuitive as just running around shooting or doing it from a third. I mean, mm, I don't know. I mean, this time, I guess the big hook is going to be open world, so it'll be even more complicated. I, <laughs> I hope it. Don't misunderstand me. I hope it does well because this looks unique. I, and I like that they're keeping some of the color stuff, and I'm all for a game that tries something different. I mean, uh, my one concern is it does look a little, some of the environments look a little, well, we've seen this before. You know, it's dystopian future number, you know, number 26570. But Yeah, shiny utopia, number nine, you know. Dystopia, dystopia. Uh, dystopia, I suppose, yes. But, to be fair, the original Mirror's Effect really used color to great effect. And if this game does that as well, and if it has a day and night cycle, well, we'll see... I don't know. Um, 
did you uh there's the new quantum break trailer this is this is the big experimental game which much like defiance a couple years back this is okay oh, take the idea of tv and game melding but it's gonna take it even further like you'll play the game and you'll have to watch an episode of the show and this game has been this game's been MIA for quite a while. They showed it last e not last E3 the E3 not, 2014 E3 I think was the last time they really showed anything for it. Uh, and what we saw in this trailer looked intriguing. It's from the Alan Wake people, so it's it's uh, it's got my attention for that because Alan Wake was a criminally under you know Alan Wake was a great game, and I say this as somebody who doesn't tend to play horror games, but uh, that was a great really unique kind of. That was a game that really that was real hard, not just oh blood and guts. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. That was it was smart, it was clever, and I'm curious to see what this is. But I'm still not sold on the big hook. Well, you know, whenever a game tries to use time as as yeah. their mechanic, if it's anything more than like bullet time, you really have to do it really really well in order for it to work. And the trailer, of course, being heavily scripted and blah blah blah. AK, you can't tell it from anything. Yeah, it, well, it was all right, but and there's the whole TV show angle, especially because that's a TV. You know, that was back when, I mean, you know, since that trailer, this is the last trailer. You know, Microsoft just basically shuttered their entire TV division. That was going to be the big hook for the Xbox One. They were going to make lots and lots of TV shows. This is one of the big question marks. Yeah. Uh, real quick, we got to see uh, Fighter Squadron mode for Star Wars Battlefront. You happen to also be a pretty big, well, Star Wars fan. Oh, the first, real quick, are you looking forward to Battlefront? I can't remember. Uh, you know, I, I, I am, um, only because, of course, I did play both of the previous Battlefront games. I, I personally have zero interest because there will be no story campaign, and the, which, fine, fair enough, but, uh, you know, combine that with I'm not much of a shooter guy in general, no can- story campaign, no thanks, but... We got to see Fire Squadron mode. What'd you think? Um, you know, I know there's, and I'm sure we'll talk about it in a sec, but um, there, there's a little controversy here and there, but the game is an alpha. So yeah. any opinions that I could kind of really share about gameplay or mechanics, uh, it looks beautiful, but then again, it's Battlefront made by Dyson EA. It's going to be flashy. Let's be honest. Assuming it works at all. Yeah. Assuming assuming day one it works at all. Um, it has to work day one. Never has there been a game they've released that has to work day one as much as this one. This is this is it. This is this is this is the moment upon which the future I think of EA and Dice in a big way in terms of people. Anyways, yeah, the Fire Squadron mode. The big complaint was it felt very superficial. You won't be able to customize, and basically the Tie Fighters and the X Wings controlled exactly the same. Like the the Tie Fighter, it, it has they both have special. They have one special attack each. The X Wing can create a like a ten second shield, and the Tie Fighter can create a two second speed boost. And this is supposed to reflect because the, the classic way it was, Tie Fighters don't have shields. They die real easy, but in numbers they're really fast. They're maneuverable and they they swarm. X Wings have shields. They're tougher, but they also are much smaller numbers, reflecting the fact that it's rebellion. But basically, they play exactly the same, and just as a long-time, you know, X-Wing, Star Fighter fan, that just rubs me the wrong way. But to be fair, what I basically heard was, it's fun for five minutes, and then you'll never play it again. And maybe that's all you need for the launch, and maybe they can go back later, like next year with DLC or something, you know? Maybe they've got bigger plans for, t- for, the, for, the, for, the, for the fighter pilot stuff in DLC, and this is just to, you know, lay the groundwork. Who knows? Yeah, th- those fighters, though, will, uh, will have a part to play in ground maps, um, just yeah, not full space combat, you know. Right. Well, this is yeah. This is partic- This is specific mode meant exactly for this. This is the fighter squadron mode. So it's it's you know it's and they did give a few details in this particular mode. You'll in addition to like I think it's ten on ten plus you'll each side will get like twenty AI to kind of round things up and you'll score more points if you kill a human person. Also. In classic Battlefront mode, it, there are also power-ups that will be generated if you, near the ground. If you pick up the power-up, you'll either transform into the Falcon or the Slave One. It's basically the hero, the hero ship. Mm-hmm. So, interesting. We'll see. It, to be fair, it, it doesn't have to stand on its own, so who knows? Yeah, just a small part of a giant hole. Any other thoughts about Gamescom, Oda? I, I, I'm interested about here at Halo's War 2, personally. I liked the original Halo's War. Uh, this is Halo's War 2 is coming from the Total War people, 
But they've also made it very clear this isn't just going to be Total War with Halo. They're going to try and this is good. They're going to take because they really liked the original Halo Wars, which is something of a. Some people really hate it. Some people really liked it. I thought it was a fun RTS. It wasn't the greatest RTS ever, but it was an interesting little thing. I'm curious about it. Scalebound, we got to see some actual gameplay. It looks intriguing. I still need to know more. I still need to see more. And Assassin's Creed Syndicate. God damn it, I'm falling for it again. <laughs> well, until they go to Japan, they, they, they don't have me back. Um, let's see. Rainbow Six Siege. Um, it's... it's uh, Rainbow Six. I mean, there's really destructible environments. I think we kind of had that before. Like, there's not yeah. a whole lot new. Some shiny graphics. You know, okay. Um, let me see here. Uh, we Happy Few continues to shape up as the next big indie hit, I think. Yeah. Um, uh, Dark Souls 3. Uh, it's Dark Souls. I mean, yeah. if they break yeah. from formula, they're, they'll lose everyone. So... I'm not, uh, yeah, I don't, uh, Crackdown 3, well, lots of explosions, but I've never been a Crackdown fan. I always found those games to be very superficial, and this looks more like more of the same. Yeah, um, let's see here. We, uh, Rise of Tomb Raider looked good. Yeah, yeah, and as I think that's sort of going to try and be a trademark of that series now, they just crank the graphics up and up and up. And... Metal Gear Solid 5, ah, oh, fuck, I don't. Frankly, we need a whole other episode, but yeah. I mean, people say, don't play, you know, this isn't a Konami game. This is really a Kojima game. Never forget. And I'm like, yeah, here's the thing. I don't really like Kojima either. <laughs> the guy has done stuff in recent years that do not make me happy. And by the way, much like I feel about certain other creators, he's not God. You know, uh, like he, he's took over the Castlevania series and that didn't really work, did it? So it's not like everything he touches turns to gold, people. <laughs> But uh, we also have Battletoads coming to Killer Instinct. Can't wait. Uh, oh, I totally wait for that. Are you kidding? Did you see it? They look hideous. Uh, they're trying to translate into. It's like it's a total clash of styles because they're trying to do like. I mean, those those the designs for the Battletoads do not work in the Killer Instinct three or whatever it's called style. I look. I took one look at that. and I was like, this is almost as bad as the Michael Bay TMNT. Yeah, and oh. it's kind of awesome that way. Like, oh, we can't be friends anymore. <laughs> it's Killer Instinct, and Killer Instinct's like war and like everything has barely ever made sense. Um, you know, when you try and fight, wait, 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 a fighting game's lore barely makes sense. The devil, you say? Hey, you know, some fighting games have a confusing yet in-depth lore. Look, I talking to a huge blaze. Blue fan here, so I, I'm just giving you a little shit. So. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I mean, Lord knows. Uh, there's going to be lots of uh, of things to kind of cover, and we'd never be able to cover it all. Um, but it was a good, it was a good Gamescom. A lot of great trailers, a lot of great interviews, a lot of fun stuff. There's plenty of reason to be optimistic. I think for the remainder of the year and for 2016, there were some questionable moments, but overall, you know, make mine video games. Yeah, you know, it's, um, you know, there's lots of things, of course, we all can say we wish we saw. Um, yeah. And, and in the end, it's Gamescom, uh, not E3. There's not as much media attention on Gamescom as E3 and such. But I mean, I did, I did find it interesting that this was basically the year where, where Microsoft decided to claim Gamescom for their own. Yeah, it's, um... And, and... To me, you know, it's actually kind of a smart move. I mean, I think one of the smartest things Nintendo did, and I'm sorry, just talking about it makes me a little sad because it makes me think of, you know, Iwata. But the Directs, I know a lot of people gave them crap for not doing the, the traditional E3 presentation, but I think the Directs have worked out really well for Nintendo. I think they let Nintendo make announcements on their terms and let them own the hype train, you know, for the weekend. And I think it's smart that Microsoft to do the same. I mean, they had a presence at E3, but this felt like E3 Part 2, the microsoft team. Because <laughs> they made actual announcements, they showed lots of new trailers, they reminded us that, you know, Quantum Break actually still exists. I mean, yeah. So, <laughs> Alright, last thought, Oda. Last thought before we go. Uh, uh, gaming is doomed, um, and... No, uh... that's not an appropriate thought. Oh, sorry, sorry. <clears throat> uh, you know, Gamescom 
in recent years has come onto the radar as a definitive place for gaming announcements and news, um, which I think is rather interesting because it's a whole nother market. It's an, it's another culture. It's actually a whole nother language um, shown by the fact that on many of the presentations, uh, they had subtitles on the yeah. screens uh, in German um, for it. And, and I think that goes to show that despite it all, despite our differences and the conflicts, that gaming really is becoming a global unifying phenomenon uh, because now big companies are embracing the overseas markets as a place where they can go and show off as opposed to just being a vestigial oh, well, we have to release it there to get more sales. Now they seem to be taking it seriously. Um, now, obviously, there's a long way to go. Um, but I think it's a great start. And uh, looking forward to next year's Gamescom. And um, we'll see where it goes from there. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, that's going to do it for this episode of Thumb Wars. As always, Oda, thanks for joining me. And thanks to all of you for watching and supporting. Please go check out my... Um, my Patreon, if, if you have the time, please make the time. It really is important. Even just a little bit of support can make a huge difference in what I do and what I can do. So, you know, there's links below. Please check it out. And as always, you can check out my other stuff. Uh, as of this airing, I will have just I will have posted a couple days ago my reviews of Fantastic Four and Dragon Ball Z Resurrection F. So if you want to hear what I thought about those two, if you, if you want to hear a grown man slowly broken by something he once loved dearly. Then there you go. If you want to hear hope die in a person's voice, that's what you can see. That's what you can listen to. Doesn't that sound like fun? Doesn't it? Doesn't it? All right. Until next time for Channel Awesome and Unrepentant Geeking, I'm Sean Cronenfeld wishing you all happy gaming.